So hi everybody, I'm very happy to be there with you and I'm going to talk about the Python C API. So my name is Victor Stiner. I'm a Python core developer for 14 years and I'm maintaining the Python continuous integration on Python upstream, which means for example fixing any issue on the GitHub actions and also the big uh, quantity of uh, billboards workers. I'm uh, fixing regressions, I'm fixing mem memory leaks and uh, race condition and things like that. And I'm working for Red Hat for 10 years and I'm backporting fixes up to Python 3.6 because we are starting to get rid of Python 2. And uh, um, I'm also fixing security fixes and backporting these fixes to all Python versions. And I am a happy Vim on the Fedora user. So on, in Python, there is something called the Python the C API. And if you don't know that, let me show you a very quick intro, introduction. At the bottom, in black, you have the Python language, so anything in Python. And at the top, in blue, you have the C word with C extensions, but also REST or C++ extensions. And in the middle, you have the green box, the, Python, the C API. So in blue, you have, for example, NumPy, PyTorch, uh, NXML, Pillow, and many C extensions, and also all, all of the bindings like Cyton, PyBind11, NanoBind, or Py03. And the idea is that every, every time that the C, C word wants to access the Python word, it has to go through the C API. And every time that the Python has to call C code, it, it has to go through the C API to, to call C functions. So it can be about converting C types, uh, ab about converting C, um, C callbacks, and in the other side, ab also about the callbacks and types from Python to C. So my long-term goal is to move to the limited C API by default, which means that everybody would be able to use a stable ABI, which is something great, and I will explain you why. But uh, this is a long-term goal, and this is not exactly the purpose of my talk. For the stable ABI, I'm very happy because David Hood covered the topic uh, very well in the previous talk. But let me try to ex explain it again. So the stable ABI, is the idea is that you build your C extensions only once, and it works on any Python version. And um, another advantage of that is that you don't have to build one package by Python version, but you can do that for, you do that once and it works on any version, so you have a single package per platform for all Python version. Here, a platform means uh, one operating system, one CPU architecture, and one C library. This uh, stable ABI was added in 2011 in Python 3.6 but uh, it was incomplete at this time, so slowly we added more and more features to make it more usable. And uh, to give you an idea on PyPI, currently there are about 500 C extensions which are using it. And just to name two big uh, projects, there is PySide Pi 6, which is a uh, binding for the Qt C++ framework, and Cryptography, which is a uh, um, toolkit for anything about uh, security. So to come back to the number of packages, this is an example with Markup Safe. Markup Safe has uh, 60 wheel packages, so binary wheel for each Python version, for each platform, for each CPU architecture. And uh, it's quite difficult to read because the list is way too long. And to compare it to PySide 6, which is using the stable ABI, there are only four wheel packages. And here maybe you can read the screen. There is one for Windows, one for Linux on the Intel CPU, one on Linux for IRM CPU, and one for macOS. So with only four files, you are able to cover the three main platforms. So the, the advantage of uh, moving to the limited C API, there are multiple advantages and reasons to do that. Uh, as a Python core developer, my, my motivation is to get more freedom to modify the internals of Python because currently when we modify the internals, we break an uh, unknown number of packages and this is quite unpleasant because we don't like breaking stuff. 
we prefer to evolve and not have to not um, force other people to have to update their code. It's also about reducing the maintenance burden of uh, third-party C extensions uh, when they update Python. And the goal for the long term is that uh, there is no update anymore because if you use a limited C API, it's very stable. And uh, you, you should expect that there is no update uh, needed anymore when you have to recompile Python. And it's also about uh, reducing the friction and the stress related to the C API just in general. So between two groups, the code developers which are evolving the C API and the community which is using the C API, so third party C extensions. Um, as a as Red Hat employee, what, what we are doing is try to update Python as soon as possible in Fedora project to, to get feedback as soon as possible. So starting at the alpha run release. But one of the issues that we have is that um, usually there are projects which are broken, which are not compatible with the new Python, and we have to update them one by one. And when you have a long dependency list of uh, many dependencies, it can take us several months to fix each dependency in the list. So the idea is that if more and more C extensions are using the stable ABI, the main advantage for me is that they are ready since the day one of the alpha one release. So it will be way quicker for us to, to test the C extensions because the dependency will be ready from day one. So we can test more packages on the first day. Obviously there are some challenges for, for this goal. Um, the, the main issue is that you have to modify C extensions. For example, to move to the limited C API, you have to modify your code to define the macro, but also to replace some function calls with some other function calls. And um, another challenge is that moving slowly towards the limited C API means also to change the C API for everybody. And every time that we touch the C API, we impact a few packages. And um, every impacted project has to modify between one and 10 lines, or maybe even more, which is still uh, annoying everybody, but we are trying to make it more and more stable over time. And the biggest uh, challenge for me is that when we modify the C API, we, we still don't know exactly how many packages are impacted, which is quite um, um, difficult for us because we want to get feedback as soon as possible and we don't want to break code, so there is still an unknown part in the project. Okay, so I explained to you what is a stable ABI, what is a limited C API, so let me introduce to you what has been done in Python 3.13 about the C API. So what's new is that we now have a C API working group, which was created last uh, November. This group is defined by the uh, charter, the PEP 731, the CE API working group charter. And the, the idea is that um, the first task of this uh, working group is to take care of the new, uh, the addition to the CE API, so the new CE API. Every time that someone wants to propose something, we review the API, we propose some changes, and we approve or reject this API. And currently we are six members, so Erland, Mike, Peter, Sergey, Steve, and me. And uh, another big uh, document, very important for this group, is the PEP uh, 733, an evaluation of Python's public C API. This group has a long list of others because we wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to express themselves about what has a concern about the C API, what to change, and um, who are the stakeholders, who, what should be done for the C API. So it's a long document trying to explain what should be changed in, in the long term. Currently, we have three projects in the C API working group. The first one is the decision project where we discuss a new, new API. So as I said, usually we don't accept the API as, as it is, but we propose some changes to follow the guidelines or to try to avoid some corner cases. And uh, we discuss the different options, what are the advantages and drawbacks of each option. And sometimes we also reject an API because there is already a way to do it using the existing C API. 
API evolution is a list of small API changes, something that we want to change, but uh, it's like a goal and we are trying to reach this goal step by step. And the third project is the API revolution. This one is more about disruptive API changes. So making the assumption that we, we can rewrite everything from scratch if we start over, what could be done to avoid some design issues. And these three projects are on the github.com on the CIPI working group uh, uh, organization. A big change that I made in Python 3.13 is to remove the private functions. So there are different reasons to remove the private function. For me, the first one is that there is no documentation. Usually there are no tests and there is no backward compatibility support, which means that you can, these functions can disappear anytime, even during a bug fix release. And uh, these private functions are not part of the limited C API, which is also an issue for the long-term project of moving towards the limited C API. And the goal is that uh, it's not only about removing the function, but it's also replacing the, fun the private functions with public one. So in Python 3.13, I removed uh, about 300 private functions in the first alpha version of Python. And it was very important for me to do it as soon as possible to get as much feedback as I can and also have time to decide what should be done if the plan doesn't go, doesn't go well. And uh, as expected, uh, it broke some projects. Expected means that I wrote a long plan with different steps for the plan and I knew that it will impact some projects, so I already prepared that I will revert changes causing most of the troubles. So for example, if a project impacted between, uh, sorry, if a change um, impacted between four, four, five and uh, 30 projects, it was just reverted. And this is exactly what we done in the second alpha version of Python 3.13. To give you an idea of the progress of the project, in the beta one of Python 3.13, 264 function, private functions has been removed. So these are the different categories of the Python C API. So in the black, you have the internal API, the one that you are not supposed to use. In, in uh, red, there is a private API which is in between. It's between public and internal. We don't know exactly the status. So this, uh, this API is um, with the prefix underscore pi. The unstable API is a specific category that we know that the API can change during the, um, and between two Python version. So pu the public API in, in blue is a regular C API. And the green one is the one which interests me. It's a limited C API, which is a subset of, of the whole thing. So the goal of removing the private function is to have less categories because I think that we had already too many categories and it was hard to follow. So to have only four categories. So now that the, that the private function has been removed, it was time to consider to pr promote some of them to public functions. So now it's the opposite. It's about adding backward compatibility support it's about writing documentation and good documentation if we can. Write also tests. And in the process of adding a new API, as I said, we know of the CIPI working group with, which helps to design a better API. So for example, we enforce error checking, we avoid the corner cases, and we try to design the documentation in advance to try to avoid some issues. And um, error checking is also about avoiding the inefficient uh, pi error occur the check. So to give you an example of uh, this work, uh, there was a private function to remove an item from a dictionary called underscore pi dict pop. And the issue with that function is that when you return null, you don't know exactly if null means not found or if an error was raised. To distinguish the two cases, you have to call the inefficient pi error occurred function. So what we did for the new public functions is to change the API a little bit 
So instead of returning an object, we return an integer with three different cases. So minus one stands for error with an exception set. Zero means, for, means not found and one means found. So the API is more straightforward, it's simpler to use and it's less error prone. Okay, so we added a new, many functions to the new Python. And this is great because the new CIPI are obviously better. They are better for three threading, they are better for immortal objects, they are better for the new Python ecosystem. But what can you do if you are using the previous Python version, for example, 3.12? For that, I created a new project called the Python CIPI compatibility. This one is providing new functions to the old Python version. So you can use all of the new functions, for example, pydict get item ref, py long as, as int, or py unicode equal to 88. Okay, we saw how I removed the many private functions and replaced them with public functions. So let me show you what has been done with the limited C API in Python 3.13. So I work on the argument clinic to support the limited C API. It means that when you define the macro pi underscore limited underscore API, it will only use functions from the limited C API and not use internal or private API. And if there is no limited C API for that, uh, the, the tool will inline uh, pri private or internal code to avoid to, to call functions. So argument clinic is a tool to, to generate the boilerplate to parse arguments for functions in C extensions. So this is an example of the FC NTL functions. You, you can see that it is a description for three parameters. The first one is a file descriptor, the second one is an integer, and the third one is an object. So previously in Python 3.12, we were only using private functions to parse this argument, so functions with the underscore pi prefix. And in the new Python, we are only using functions from the limited C API, like pi error format, pi object as file descriptor, or pi long as int. So why did I make this work on the argument clinic? Uh, the problem was that the limited CIPI was not really used or tested in Python itself. There, was, uh, there were only two basic uh, tests. So the idea is that if I'm able to convert some extensions to the um, limited CIPI, it's a way to test our own limited API and make sure that it works not only on trivial code but also on non-trivial code. It's also part of the motto, eating your own dog, dog food which means here to you consume our own API. So thanks to that work, I managed to convert the 16 standard C extensions to the limited C API, which is a, a way again to test the, uh, the limited C API. For example, the error number, MD5, resources, or UUID are now using the limited C API. And for that work, I also had to write a PEP the PEP 737 unified type formatting to format a type name in an error message. And the PEP adds two new formats, percent uppercase T and percent uppercase N. Okay, we saw what has been done in the limited CIPI in Python 3.13. So let me show you what's, what's coming next. I think I have to mention the HPy project HPy project is a new C API which looks like the Python C API, but it's a brand new C API. And I think it's worth it to have a look because um, the main advantage of HPy is that it's way more efficient on PyPy. It is designed with PyPy in mind. And uh, thanks to that, uh, it avoids the, um, the bottleneck of the Python C API and it's the um, and then the design is make it way more efficient, but it's also very efficient on C Python, obviously. And another big advantage is that there is something called the universal mode, where you build your C extension once, and it works basically anywhere. 
So it's something like a stable ABI for C Python. So it works on any C Python version. But it's also a stable ABI for PyPy. So it works on any PyPy version. So you build your C extension once and it works on anything, which is something great. And by the way, there is an ongoing work to port NumPy to HPy, and I hope that uh, they will manage to finish it because that would that would be great to have a NumPy working on all Python version. So about moving to the limited CI by default, uh, as I said, it's a long-term goal because there are still work to do. So there are different stakeholders uh, when when it comes to C API. Uh, these are ma mainly bindings. Cyton, for example, you should refer to the talk of David Hoods just before me. So it's still ex it's, it's mostly done. It works, but there are features which are not supported, and it's still an opt-in build mode. Uh, so it's not the default. For Pi03, it's also an opt-in build mode, but they are considering to make it the default, which is very great. The, there is a Pi by the 11th for C++. They don't support the limited C API. Nanobinds, they, they have an opt-in build mode, and it's 100% uh, feature complete, so you can totally use it without any issue. And CFFI, I don't think that they support the limited C API. So how to use the limited C API? The, the idea is that you have a pi underscore limited underscore API macro that you have to define to a, to a X version of Python. So th this is an example to target Python 3.8. And for Cyton, you also have to define the macro Cyton underscore limited underscore API to one. Finally, if you want to check if your C extensions is fully compliant with the stable ABI, you can use a, co a tool called ABI Free Audit. This tool will check which uh, symbols you are importing and check if the symbols are all part of the stable ABI. And you can find it on github.com slash trail of bits slash ABI Free Audit. Thank you for your attention and uh, tell me if you have any question. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I don't know if the question is maybe a bit too specific, but uh, currently we're using a lot of PyBind, and as you said, it's not compatible. Um, I know that NanoBind, I think, is from some of the same authors. Do you know how easy it would be to switch for us to NanoBind and also use the limited C API there? Uh, sadly, I'm not used to this project, so I know that NanoBind is, uh, is a new project and is supposed to be as complete or or maybe even replaced by by Deliven, but I have no idea how easy it is to migrate. You should give it a try. Thank you. So, so when you switch these internal internal extension modules, the I, I forget which ones they were. Was there any kind of cost to it? Did it make them slower or anything like that? Oh yeah, so the question is about the um, standard library C extensions that I compiled with the limited C API. Yep. I tried to target only the C extensions which are not really performance sensitive. And I tried to, to check the generated code, especially using argument clinic, if the code looks uh, as fast uh, or not. And I also run some uh, benchmark. So in that case, there is no impact on performance because it's basically um, the same function call or function counts which are as fast. But um, I decided to not convert the underscore statistics extension because this one was using a vector call and after the conversion, it was using a variable argument calls, which is a calling convention, which is a slower. So depending on the calling convention, sometimes it can be slower. And uh, the limited C API doesn't support all calling convention uh, the same way. So the new way using a vector call or fast call is not fully supported yet. So in short, I only 
converted the C extensions if there, if there was no impact on performance. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, thank you for your work on this. Um, what would it take uh, for um, set up tools or I don't know, build tools um, to provide the tooling for limited API so that when you say uh, this flag, I'm using limited, I want to build for a stable API or one, I want to use limited API, it would just fail the build if you didn't use, if you use private functions or something that's not inside the set of limited API. So the question is how to build uh, C extensions using setup tools? <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, as far as I understand, uh, you show this, this tool that uh, checks whether you are uh, really using limited API, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My question is why do we even need this tool? If you can explain that and if there is a road towards not needing such tool, towards like if I want to use limited API, I set some macro or some flex somewhere and the build fails. Like when I'm building the extensions. Uh, if, you, if you use a macro, uh, you cannot access something which is not part of the limited C API. But from what I understood is that because the limited C API is too limited, sometimes people use functions which are not part of the limited C API. So they don't define the macro. And in that case, you can be not fully compliant with the stable API. All right. OK. Well, I don't still understand why, why I would need this tool. That's the question. What, 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 like if, if I define the macro, it should fail. The build should fail, right? If you define the macro for the whole project, it should fail, yes. You should be good. So like people don't define the macro and then use a the tool to find out what they would have found out if they defined the macro. The tool is useful if you don't use a macro. And, okay. uh, if you are in the process of migrating to the limited C API. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, when going to the alpha one release where you removed all those functions, um, did you already had a good idea of like how much you would break and is it a big issue not knowing what you're going to break or are there like things that you can use already to like inspect other open source projects like these are actually being used? Okay, so um, in general, when we modify the C API, what we are doing is to run a code charge on the most popular PyPI C extensions. So I have a tool to download, to download uh, 8,000 uh, packages and to run code charge. And uh, thanks to that, I have, I have an estimation on how many packages will be impacted. But sometimes um, it's, not, it's just an estimation. You don't know exactly if the code is really used because you have to read the code to check if it's only used on Python 2 or if it's only used in Python 3. And you don't know if, if it's only a command or if it's used in practice. And uh, this is only a subset of the whole e ecosystem. So there is a way to have this estimation, but it's not enough. And it's still a big uh, issue for, for me to not know exactly how many projects are impacted. That's why I started uh, since Alpha 1 to get uh, as much time as possible to address the issue for everybody and have a backup plan also. To, if everything breaks, just reverts the work and uh, come back to the previous state. Okay, thanks. You mentioned uh, HPy and its universal mode being a more generalized version of the stable AVI. Do you see a future, a rather long-term future, where CPython would adopt such a project and make it its API revolution? Huh, that's a good question. Um, HPy project currently is uh, separated from the Python C API. It's something external, and uh, the design of the SC of the ABI is very different. It's like uh, is you have Python, you have a layer which is a universal layer on top of it, and the, the C extensions uh, which is on top of that. So there are three layers, and uh, Python C API is very different. It's like you have Python which is the first layer and the C extension. So it's only two layers. And for Python, for, for the Python C API, it doesn't make sense to have three layers. 
So currently, it's, there is no project to, to move towards that. But maybe the limited CIPI is not a good idea, and maybe everybody should move to the HPI. It's a little bit too early to, to, know, to know which approach is the best. Okay, we're just about out of time, so thank you, Victor. And we will be continuing at 11.55 with Pablo Salgado telling us about obscure Cython bugs. <laughs>